What's going on guys? In today's video, we're going to go over three questions that I think are some of the harder questions that are tested on the digital SAT. And by hard, I mean from scale from one to five, one being a very easy question and a five being an impossible question. These questions fall right at difficulty four. They are like just kind of challenging enough, but not too difficult to the point where you just want to give up studying for the SAT and drop out of high school and become a baking powder dealer on a Friday night in the back alley of a club. Been there, done that, it's not as fun as you would think, and 10 out of 10, highly recommend you just stay in school. So with all that being said, let's get to these questions and let's get a higher score on your next SAT. All right, guys, so that's what the first question looks like. And if it's your first time here, my name is John and I am not your baking powder dealer, but I've been an SAT math tutor for the past 11 years. And my specialty is taking a student who's currently in four, five, 600 range to 700 plus by their next SAT. And the three questions we're gonna go over today is going to be in the order of increasing difficulty. So I highly recommend you getting a piece of paper and try to question yourself before you watch me solve it. That will be the best way for you to get the most out of each of these questions. So let's get into it. Number one, the question says, the table shows three values of X and their corresponding values of G of X, where G of X is this, and F is a linear function. What is the Y intercept of the graph of Y is equal to F of X on the X, Y plane? So that was a lot of words. So let's kind of break down what the question is telling us. We have function G of X and G of X is equal to F of X divided by X plus three. And we know function F is going to be what? It's going to be a linear function. And we have to find the Y intercept of this linear function. So the first thing is that whenever you're looking for the Y intercept of a linear function, the only way to do so is by coming up with a line equation, Y equals MX plus B. Once you have this, you're going to know what the slope is and what the Y intercept is. But for you to come up with this equation, you are actually going to just need two coordinates from the line. And where can we get that? Well, we know f of x is part of g of x. And on this graph over here, we know the coordinates for g of x. So we can plug this in and do the math and come up with two coordinates that actually belong to f of x. Sounds good. So the game plan is come up with the coordinates, come up with the equation and get the y intercept. And that's going to be our answer. So let's figure out the coordinates. Let's plug these into this function right there. When g of x is three, your x value is going to be negative 27. So three is equal to f of x divided by minus 27 plus three, which is going to be three is equal to f of x minus 24, which means f of x is going to be negative 72. So it's going to be 72 right there. Let's go for the second coordinate. When g of x is equal to zero, x is minus nine. So zero is equal to f of x divided by minus nine plus three, which becomes zero is equal to f of x divided by negative six, which means f of x is going to be just zero. So it's going to be zero right there. So we now have the two coordinates we are looking for. And now do we need to find the third coordinate? Not really, you just need two coordinates and we already have two coordinates right there. So with the coordinates in place, we're going to first find out what the slope is and slope is going to be y2 minus y1. So y2 minus y1, zero minus negative 72 divided by x minus x1 minus nine subtracted by negative 27 which is gonna be 72 divided by 18, which means our slope is going to be just four. So it's just going to be four right there. So our equation is gonna be y is equal to four x plus b. And now we can find the y intercept by plugging in one of the coordinates. I'm gonna plug in the second set because first set numbers are really big and it's gonna be hard to work with. So always make your life easy by picking easy numbers. So when our y is equal to zero, our x is going to be negative nine, and we're gonna add b to it, which gives us zero is equal to negative 36 plus b, which means b is equal to just positive 36. So that tells us our y intercept is going to be positive 36, positive 36, that's going to be our y intercept that has a coordinate at zero positive 36. Our answer is going to be choice A. So does that make sense, guys? So there were a lot of steps involved, but there are two main takeaways here. One is that whenever you're looking for a y intercept, you first have to generate the equation of the line. And for you to generate the equation of the line, you need two coordinates from that line. And for this question, we simply use the table and the function provided to find the two coordinates for the function f. Remember, you don't have to get the third one because you only need two coordinates. And second, these questions are not really meant to be complicated, but it just involves a lot of steps and a lot of writing. So for these types of questions, it's very important for you to have that skill of keeping everything organized and writing your work down neatly. Because SAT is betting on the fact you are going to make a mistake at some point and to not make any mistakes, you have to stay organized and write stuff neatly. So that's it. Let's go to the next question. Number two, a rectangle is inscribed in a circle such that the vertex of the rectangles lie on the circumference of the circle. The diagonal of the rectangle is twice 
twice the length of the shortest side of the rectangle. The area of the rectangle is this square unit. What is the length of the diameter of the circle? And Jesus Christ, that's a lot of words. So first, we're going to break it down piece by piece and try to understand exactly what's going on. And when it comes to these complicated wordy questions, guys, highly recommend you guys visualize out what the question is telling you. So first, the question tells us there is a rectangle inscribed in a circle. So inside of a circle, there is going to be a rectangle drawn into it such that the vertex of the rectangle lies in the circumference. So vertex of a rectangle is referring to the corners of the rectangle. So corners are touching the circumference. And the question tells us the diagonal of the rectangle is twice the length of the shortest side. So the diagonal of the rectangle over here is going to be twice the size of the shortest side of the rectangle. So for example, if the short side is X, the long side is going to be twice, it's going to be two X. And the area of the rectangle is going to be that square units. So area is going to be length times width, and that's going to be 1089 root three. So what is the diameter of the circle? What is this diagonal inside of a rectangle? So some students might get stuck on this question, but here's what you have to realize. For the SAT, whenever you come across geometry questions and you see a radical three, honestly, there's no reason for a geometry question to have a radical unless it involves special right triangles. Why? Because special triangle is one of very few cases on the SAT where a shape has a radical three involved. And that's going to be our starting point. And honestly, it could work out. It might not work out, but on the SAT, you just have to roll with what you get. So when it comes to a special right triangle, you must have a right angle. And when it comes to a rectangle, we know that all the corners are going to be 90 degrees. So the triangle that we happen to see here is also going to be a right triangle. And when a right triangle has a ratio of X and two X, the third remaining side automatically becomes X root three. That is the golden ratio. So we have a right triangle and we have X two X, which means the third side must be x root 3. And when we think about the equation of the rectangle, we know this is going to be the area which comes from length times width, and it's going to be this times that. So x times x root 3 is equal to 1089 root 3. So x squared root 3 is equal to 1089 root 3. Cancel out, cancel out. x squared is equal to 1089, which means x is equal to square root 1089, and we are going to get 33. And would 33 be our answer? No, because 33 is just the shortest side of the rectangle. We are looking for the diameter, also known as the diagonal of this rectangle. So if X is equal to 33, then 2X is equal to just 66. That will be our final answer. So does that make sense, guys? So here's the main takeaway from this question. First is that anytime you see a radical three in a geometry question for the SAT, there's a very, very, very high chance that the question is going to be dealing with special right triangles. Because outside of special right triangles, there's honestly no reason for there to be a radical three. And another variation of this would be if you have a radical two in the question, that would also be a special right triangles because a 45, 45, 90 triangle is going to have a ratio of X, X, and X root two. And that's pretty much the only time you would see radical two most of the times. Not always, but very, very high chance. And second is that anytime you have a special right triangles, look at the side length carefully. Of these three side length, if you happen to see like two of these or two of these or two of these or two of these, the question is probably hinting at you to use special right triangles to solve that question. And last but not least, when it comes to these hard questions that you are having trouble with, always try to visualize out what the question is telling you. Here's a little bit of bro science, but when you try to visualize the stuff in your head versus you visualizing it out on the paper and drawing it out, you're gonna be able to see what you couldn't see before. The benefit of visualizing has been pretty much shown in every single one of my students, and you literally have everything to gain and nothing to lose. So highly recommend it. All right, let's go to the third and the last question. This one's a little bit rough, but honestly, guys, it's just SAT, nothing you can't handle. Let's get into it. Number three, in the XY plane, a circle has a center C with this coordinate right there, point A, B lie in the circle, and A has coordinate right there, and ACB is going to be a right angle. So what is the length of AB? So a lot of words, sounds complicated. So if that's the case, what do you have to do? You have to, say it with me, visualize what the question is telling you. So the question says, we have a circle that has center C on coordinates H and K. So we have a coordinate of H and K, and that's going to be our center. And we have a circle that looks like that. Actually, looks something like this, a little bit prettier. 
and it says point A has coordinate at this coordinate right there, and ACB is a right angle. So our center is going to be C, and point A has coordinates at H plus one and K plus that. So how do we know where that is? Well, we know that's going to be X coordinate, and that's going to be the Y coordinate, right? And if you are adding one to the X coordinate, what's essentially happening is you're shifting it to the right one. And if you're adding onto the Y coordinate, you're essentially moving it up by that much. So from center of C, we are moving right by one, right by one, and up by radical 102. So it's going to be one right there, and then radical 102 right there. And that's going to be our coordinate A. And the question tells us ACB is a right angle. So B is another coordinate that lie on the circle, right? So it's got to be on here somewhere, but it has to be a coordinate where it forms a right angle at A, C, B. And I was asking what's the length of AB, which is going to be right there. Let's zoom in a little bit. So that's what the question gives us. Let's piece it together and read in between the lines. We are given a right triangle and we have to find the missing side. And for the SAT, there's only three ways in which a missing side can be found on a right triangle. You either use Sokotoa from trigonometry, special right triangles, or use the Pythagorean theorem. And for you to use Sokotoa and special right triangles, you must know the angles of the triangle. But in this case, we don't know any angles, we only know the side length. So that means we have to use Pythagorean theorem to find the answer which is a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. We're looking for the hypotenuse, which is the c squared. So we need to find out what our a is and what our b is, which are going to be right here. And how can we find that? Well, if we think about it, this triangle over here is also a right triangle because it went right and then it went straight up, right? up, it forms a right angle. And if we look carefully, the side length of this small triangle was just radical 102 and one right there. So if we do one squared plus radical 102 squared, we're going to get C squared. And that's going to be one plus 102, which is going to be 103. That's going to be our C squared, which means our C value is going to be square root of 103. So that means within this small triangle over here, this side length is going to be measuring radical 103. And because this side length is also a radius from the circle, it's also going to be radical 103. It's kind of hard to see, so let me clear it up a little bit. We have a circle and we have a right triangle right there and the side length are going to be root 103 and then root 103. And we're looking for this side length AB right there. And because it's a right triangle, we can use Pythagorean. This square plus that square is equal to this square. So root 103 squared plus root 103 squared is equal to C squared. It's going to be 103 plus 103 is equal to 206. It's going to be C squared, which means C is going to be radical 206. That's going to be 206 right there, which means this side length is going to be radical 206 like so. So what is the length of AB? Our AB is going to be radical 206. So does that make sense, guys? So again, it involved a lot of steps here, but here are the main takeaways. First is that you always want to visualize what the question is telling you and stay organized with your work. And second, more importantly, you want to have mapped out in your head on what types of question SAT is going to give you. Here's what I mean. When we visualized out this question, we realized that, oh, we are simply looking for a missing side length in a right triangle, right? Missing side length in a right triangle. And when it comes to SAT, there's only three ways in which this could be done. It's either through Sokotoa or special right triangles or Pythagorean theorem. SAT will not test you on anything outside of these three things. And because the first two options involved angles and we don't know any angles for this question, that brought us to the conclusion that, oh, this question must be solved using Pythagorean theorem. And we did that and we were able to get to the answer. It makes SAT very, very easy when you have all of these things like mapped out in your head. But the only problem is that it takes a lot of time, effort, and practice. You just kind of have to pick it up as you go. But there is a shortcut solution to this problem, and that's what I call mental mappers. Mental mappers will literally outline the exact process that I went through for every single concept that is tested on the SAT. When you see this and this, it's testing you on this on the SAT. And when you see this and that, it's testing you on that for the SAT. And if you have made it this far, I'm going to give you the mental mapper for parabola questions on the SAT. It will literally give you all the combinations for parabola questions you will see on the SAT. And you can get it by clicking the video in the top right corner. So that's going to be it. If you guys have any questions, leave in the comment section down below and I'll see you on the next video.